2. This is Pentecost Sunday, and so we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2. We're going to be doing some teaching and some preaching. For those of you who are in the adult Sunday school class, we were also talking about Pentecost, so there may be some overlapping here, but repetition is a good thing. Acts chapter 1, beginning with, I mean, Acts chapter 2, sorry, starting with verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. We've been reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. We're going to stop there for today. We're going to pick this up with Peter's message to them in the upcoming verses. As I asked in our Sunday school class this morning, which came first? Which came first? The name of the holiday, Pentecost, or the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the believers on this day. Which came first, the name of the holiday or this event? If you're in Sunday school, you can't answer. Which came first, the name of the holiday or this event? The name of the holiday, very good. If I had a prize, you'd get it. Pentecost was actually a festival, a celebration in the Jewish culture, okay? Here's another one. See if you can be Herbert. What did it celebrate? What did they celebrate on during the Feast of Pentecost? What were they celebrating? What had just happened? What season was it? No, sorry. The harvest? Sorry. Harvest? Very good. They were celebrating the fact that God had blessed them with a harvest. They were celebrating the harvest season. So Jesus had told his disciples, you read this in the first chapter of Acts. Jesus had told his disciples to stay in Jerusalem and wait. How many of you love to wait? Whether you're on hold on the phone or you're in line. You know how banks are only open in the mornings on Saturday, right? Colin was going to go to the bank yesterday morning. He called me and goes, I can't go to the bank. The line is out the door and around the, around the building. Okay. That's like, I don't know, I probably go to the bank yesterday. I don't know why. How many of you love standing in lines? None of us does, right? <laughs> Jesus told his disciples, stay. How many of you like to stay? Many of us like to go. We want to be on the go. We feel like we're not accomplishing anything if we're not going. Stay and wait. They waited for 10 days. What were they waiting for? The day of Pentecost. God had a plan. God was orchestrating things. We're going to look at that today. The day of Pentecost. Just as Jesus' crucifixion needed to be on the Passover, 
the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was to be on Pentecost. Just a little review, Passover was when a sacrificial lamb had been slain for each of the Jewish families back in the book of Exodus. The blood of that lamb was placed basically on the door jamb of their home. When the death angel came through to destroy the Egyptians, when that angel saw the blood on their doorposts, he would pass over them, spare them. Otherwise, they would lose the firstborn of their children, the firstborn of their cattle, everything. But the angel passed over them, spared them when they saw the blood. Jesus is yours and mine. He is our Passover lamb. His blood applied to our hearts saves us from the eternal death for our sins. What happened to Jesus had to happen on Passover. Pentecost, as we mentioned, celebrated the harvest. Jesus promised that the baptism of the Holy Spirit would give us boldness to witness and bring in a harvest of souls. God had orchestrated everything. What better time to initiate the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues than at Pentecost? This baptism in the Holy Spirit would give believers power. Power to witness. Power to bring in a harvest of souls. God orchestrated everything. What better way to init initiate a spiritual harvest than by the Holy Spirit giving utterance in tongues, languages unknown to the believers? that just happened to be in the languages of all the foreigners who were in Jerusalem for the celebration. God orchestrated everything. Amen. God so loved those people who were in Jerusalem for that special holiday that he made it possible for them to hear the good news, hear the works of God in their own mother tongue. How awesome. Would you have loved to have been there? Now there were three phenomena that took place that day. Wind, fire, and tongues. Not earth, wind, and fire. Wind, <laughs> fire, and tongues. Let's look at the wind, which Jesus said, you can't do, you can't see the wind, right? <laughs> wind is used throughout scripture to represent the Holy Spirit. Is that a coincidence? Of course. It also represented cleansing. In one illustration in the Old Testament, it, it separates grain from the chaff. What is chaff? It's the residue, right? It's it's the part you don't eat. It has to be, you know how you call corn, right? So yeah, the wheat has to be removed. The chaff has to be removed from the wheat. If you look in the bulletin, which we're going to do in a little while, I've shared there the Hebrew name for the Holy Spirit, Ruach, and you got to get the Anytime you see the CH in Hebrew words, you got to Ruach, say it. Ruach. Ruach Elohim means God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. In Hebrew, the word ruach means either spirit or wind. Is that a coincidence? No. In Greek, pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneumonia, has to do with respiratory, air, wind, right? The Greek word for the Holy Spirit, pneuma, means spirit and wind. So, the wind was not coincidental. It was a god. Another phenomenon that day that they saw was fire. It says it looked like tongues of fire. Now this tongues of fire has nothing to do with the tongues in which they spoke. 
It simply means, you know when you're, you're, you've got a, a campfire going and the flames are going up, doesn't it kind of look like tons of fire or flames, right? That when you draw it, there's that certain shape of the, the flames. It said it looked like tons of fire came and rested upon each of them. I'm not sure what exactly that looked like, but it was something very visible that people could see. Fire is used throughout scripture as also representing the Holy Spirit. It was representative of judgment and cleansing. Fire burns away the chaff from the ground. Wind will remove it. Fire will burn it away. The wind and the fire weren't merely attention getters so that people would see and hear what was going on. It did that. But they indicated to the recipients it represented to those who were observing that those who were experiencing this miracle from God were to be living godly, holy lives in order to receive the baptism. That is still a prerequisite. There is a preparation that needs to take place in our hearts before we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now the wind and the fire Stay with me here. We're situational, not normative. Now, it may be just way too early in the morning you're figuring out what that means. So I'll let you know what it means. Situational means it was for that particular situation. It's not something that happens or is to be practiced across all time. That day, on the day of Pentecost, when God was moving by his spirit to initiate the early church to prepare his people for what was yet to come that we will learn about in the book of Acts and beyond. It was situational. The wind and the fire were for that day, that experience, those people in that place. It's never mentioned again in scripture. Something that is normative, the word normal comes to mind. Something that is normative is for us to learn from and pattern our behavior after for all of time. The tongues in this situation were normative. The wind and fire were situational. For that day, that place, those people. The tongues were normative. From then on till today and beyond. God saw fit to make tongues the initial, the first physical evidence. We talked about this today in Sunday school. Evidence is what? Proof. Initial means what? First. First physical proof of what? That that person, those people, have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why would we need proof? Because otherwise we might question, have I been or have I been? The first physical proof that we have been baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, is that God will supernaturally give us tongues that we've never learned. As I also mentioned in Sunday school, this is where some people kind of check out and they just say, mm, I don't think so. That's too weird for me. Let me say at this point in our message today, God is not weird. God doesn't give us anything that's weird. God doesn't give us anything that's dangerous or of the devil. There are people who teach that speaking in tongues is of the devil. Why would God give us something? from the enemy. He wouldn't. God's not weird. He doesn't give us anything that's weird. God is supernatural. He gives us the gift of tongues as a supernatural gift. In other words, hear me. Every time
time a believer speaks in tongues, he or she is experiencing a miracle. Who would want that? Just for what it is, a miracle. We're going to see there, there are other benefits. But it's a miracle. Every time we speak in an unknown language, a prayer language to God, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Yes, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit is still very much available to all believers today. Some teach that the infilling of the Holy Spirit ceased after the first century, after what we're reading about today on the day of Pentecost. They're called cessationalists, to cease. But, turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Acts 2, beginning with verse 38. Peter replied, this is going to be part of our message next week, but I want it to be a part of this week too. Repent. What does it mean to repent? Turn around. Turn around, 180. You're going this way into sin, you turn around 180 and you begin to go God's way. Repent and be baptized in water. What does that represent? Why do we get baptized in water? Does it save us? Do we get saved by being baptized in water? No. Baptism in water represents what has happened to us spiritually when we ask Christ into our hearts. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will. Not you might. Yeah, if you work hard. Yeah, I don't know. If you're good, no. You will receive the gift. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is God's gift to us. And we'll see its purpose in just a moment. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39. The promise. What promise? that you will receive the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Say this out loud. That's me. That's me. Oh, you sound so excited. That's me. That's me. The promise is for you and you and you and you and me. The promise is for you, your children, those immediately after you, those who are far off generationally and even logistically. Do you know that you and I are almost exactly halfway around the world from Jerusalem? Do you realize that? Just by virtue of living in Hawaii. We are about half the world away. To those who are far off, we are far off from them generationally and logistically. The promise is for you, your kids, and those that you will never even meet. There are those who teach this experience ceased after the disciples experienced it. Why would God promise something and then renege on it? Why would he say it's for you, your kids, and those who are far off, and then go, man, eh, maybe I'll just stop it now. God doesn't do that. He is still keeping his promise to them today. Every time someone receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit, God is fulfilling this promise. For all. Say all. 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 Louder. All. Are you convinced? All. All. Whom the Lord our God will call. Some people interpret that to say, well, not everybody's meant to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He just said all. Whom the Lord will call to himself in salvation. The promise 
of the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the physical evidence of speaking in tongues is intended for all believers. Don't ever let anybody tell you it's not. Because this is God's word. Every believer is eligible to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Turn back to the book of Joel. When was the last time you read the book of Joel this morning? This morning. Awesome. Joel chapter 2. You probably read these very verses. Yes. <laughs> Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Have you found Joel yet? Say amen. Oh my, it's quiet. Joel. <laughs> Joel. Amen. One of those small minor prophets. Not minor because it's unimportant. Just minor because it's short. Joel chapter 2. Amen? Amen. Okay, that's better. Joel 2.28 says, And afterward, God is speaking. I will pour out my spirit on, on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Doesn't mean go sleep now, man, okay? Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. What days? We are in those days, church. We are in those days on God's time table. Baptism in the Holy Spirit, the power that comes with it is for all people, young and old, male and female, believers. Why would God make a cross-generational promise and then renege on it? He wouldn't. His promise is still in effect. He is still fulfilling that promise on a daily basis around the world. I love reading missionary stories. You should know that about me by now. I love hearing about how God moves by his spirit in various countries. Hearing about them receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit without even really knowing what it is. They are just open and receptive and they want more of God and he answers. If we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we will be filled. If we ask him for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, he will give it to us. He doesn't play hide and seek or keep away. He wants it for us more than we want it for ourselves. Speaking in tongues is normative. What does normative mean? Some brave soul who just learned it. What does it mean? Normal. Normal. Okay. Speaking in tongues is normative. How do we know that? Acts chapter 2, what we just read this morning on the day of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, after Peter and John's appearance before the Sadducees, they were kind of like called on the carpet. The believers gathered for a prayer meeting after that experience. Acts 4.31 says this, When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Are you seeing how the baptism of the Holy Spirit and boldness go together? Because Jesus promised in Acts 1.8, you will receive power. After the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Power to witness. Here in Jerusalem, where you live, in Judea, even Samaria, they didn't even like the Samaritans. They didn't get along with them. The Holy Spirit will even give us power and the love to witness to our enemies. And then he said, and to the uttermost part of the world. 
which to them was pretty much any place beyond Judea or Samaria. Remember, they traveled by foot or camel. No planes, trains, or automobiles. That must have seen, that must have blown their minds. But that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And it was like our Sunday school lesson said this morning, Jesus knew when he made that promise, he knew he was telling them to do something that was absolutely impossible for them on their own, in their own power, to accomplish. That was the whole idea. The Holy Spirit will give you power to reach the entire world. Acts chapter 8, the spirit-filled Jews were shocked when they saw that the Samaritans had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. They didn't think it was possible. So you see, when God moves in his fullness, he doesn't ask our permission. He doesn't seek our counsel. Because the Jews would have said, the Samaritans, I think not. And God said, I think so. And he baptized the Samaritans in the Holy Spirit. God loves tearing down our prejudices, Amen. our ideas of how things ought to be done. He doesn't need yours or mine. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 9, Saul turned Paul. Saul persecuted the church. Saul killed Christians. That was what he did. That was what he was known for. Saul turned Paul. He changed more than his name. He changed his entire belief system, his entire behavioral system. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He testifies about it in the book of Corinthians. He testified that he spoke in tongues. Acts chapter 10. Believers in Cornelius' house. The day of Pentecost was when the Jews, remember it says God-fearing Jews, filled Jerusalem for the celebration of Pentecost. That's when the Jews received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit fell on the gathering of Cornelius' house, does Cornelius sound like a Jewish name? No. no, he was a Gentile believer. The gathering of believers at his home was the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. Awesome. Yeah. Mark that in your Bible. It's Acts chapter 10. Now, the Holy Spirit had come upon the Samaritans. They were half-breeds. <laughs> so it had started already with men. But the initial outpouring upon the Gentiles was at Cornelius' house. And how Cornelius and Peter hooked up, you got to read it. It's a God thing. And we see in that God loves not only the Jews. He loves the Gentiles, which is why we can thank God, because that proves God loves us, and that all that God has is for us, as well as the Jews. And also in Acts chapter 19, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the Ephesian believers. So you see, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was normative. We can learn from it. We can we can pattern. Our behavior, our seeking, our receiving after what we see in the Word. So what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? What is our theology about the baptism in the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit indwells us, lives within us from the moment we first ask Christ to forgive our sins and come into our lives. I love the way one man described it, John Stankowski. He was the director of the Celebrant Singers. I don't think they function anymore. He, he, we got acquainted with them. They came and sang first at Koloa, way back ancient history on the island of Goa. John Stankowski said this, when we get saved, we have the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. 
when we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, He has us. His power comes into our lives in a way it didn't before. And it's not to say that we become puppets and, you know, he's some kind of puppeteer and we have to do what he says. But he has us because we want him to have us. We surrender to him as we are filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's a surrender there that goes beyond our surrender when we first get saved. It's a deeper relationship with it's more of Jesus in the world. And church, who doesn't want that? Amen. Who of us here would raise our hands before God and everybody and say, I don't need any more of God. I don't need any more. I've got enough. If we say that to God, he will honor that. He will honor that because he's a gentleman. He will give us exactly as much of himself as we want. Think about that. God gives us exactly as much of himself as we want. As we allow him to. Therefore, spirit baptism is an additional work of the already indwelling Holy Spirit. It's just more. It's more. It's more of what Jesus has for us. To receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a requirement for going to heaven. But it is God's will for every believer to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Pick up your bulletin. What does the very bottom of the cover say? Yeah, thank you, my want you to seek the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is God's will for every believer. Say every believer. Every believer. In Sacramento or Siberia, it is God's will for every believer to receive the baptism, the fullness of of the Holy Spirit. Why does God want that for us? Because it brings us into a deeper relationship with Christ. There is some incorrect teaching out there which has stemmed from fear. Some people say that it's not for every believer. Not everybody is even intended to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let me let you in on something. That's a cop-out because people are scared of it, because people have prayed for it and not yet received it, so they just, well, it's not for me. Cop-out. It is God's will for every believer to be filled with his Holy Spirit. People are afraid of the unknown or what they've never yet experienced. There's a fear of losing control. God's not committed to control anything. Well, that's another whole message. There are fears involved. Let go of fear and trust God that what he has for us is good for us. It is actually necessary. We need it. We can go to heaven without it. We need it in our everyday relationship, in the world in which we live. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's experience God's miracles. Y'all look so excited about that prospect. Let's experience God's miracles. Let's experience God's power. gives us more power. And who doesn't need that? 
When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we become bolder in witnessing. We have more and deeper love for God and for people. We experience more victory in our walk with Christ. Why? Because we become stronger spiritually. Paul uses the word edify. We're going to look at that in a few minutes. And we also have greater understanding of God's word because the Holy Spirit gives us that. We receive power to be bolder, to be more loving, to be more victorious, and to have greater understanding of God's word. Who in this house does not need that? Amen. We all need it. Amen. To me, we all need everything God's got for us. Amen. As I said before, God's not weird. He doesn't make us weird. People make things weird. So do things according to God's word, and you'll be okay. You'll be okay. We see tongues in two different ways in Scripture. There's the initial physical evidence of having received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We see it in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. The purpose of it, and here's the word, is for edification. What does it mean to edify? First of all, what is an edifice? E-I, E-D-I, F-I-C-E. What's an edifice? I learned this this morning. It's a building. You're in one. <laughs> this is an edifice. It has been built. The word edify means to build up. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, as we pray in our spirit-given language, he builds us up from the inside. He builds us up in our spirit. He strengthens us. Remember the word power? He builds us up. The purpose of our praying in our heavenly language that we receive when we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit is that we will be strengthened and built up spiritually. That's what it does. In Ephesians 6.18 it says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. There's not a position we have to assume in order to pray in the spirit. We can do it while we wash the car or while we're, while we're driving the car. We can do it under our breath anywhere. Pray in the spirit. Jude, verse 20. There's only one chapter, so Jude, verse 20. says, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit. It was normal in the New Testament church. Church, it ought to be normal in our church. Amen. In the church, capital C, the body of Christ worldwide, it is normal. It is necessary. Why? Because it builds us up. Strengthens us. Individually, personally. The gift of tongues we read about in 1 Corinthians. This is exercised in the gathering of believers. When the Holy Spirit anoints someone, gives them a message in tongues. The qualification is if it's done in the body, there needs to be an interpretation. Why? How can somebody be built up if they can't understand it? So in other words, the Holy Spirit may give someone a message in tongues. He may give that person or another person the interpretation in the language of those who are gathered so that they may understand and be built up as a body. So we see those two instances of speaking in tongues. Romans chapter 8, 
The Word of God tells us that the Spirit even helps us in our praying. There are times we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray. But as we pray in the language that the Holy Spirit gives us, church, when we speak in tongues, it is our mouth, it is our tongue, it is our voice, but the words come supernaturally from the Holy Spirit. That is perfectly normal. And the Word tells us it's something we should seek after, it's something we should desire, we should want. The Spirit of God helps us in our praying. It's as if the Spirit of God, capital S, prays through our spirit, small s. Don't you think the will of God will be accomplished if the Spirit of God is praying through us? The Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, as powerful ministry in our lives, not only helping us to pray. Jesus tells us in John chapters 15 through 17, the Holy Spirit teaches us, leads us, guides us in the truth, which tells us God's never going to lie to us. And the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. He will help us understand the truth. He will help us to live the truth. He will help us to teach the truth. He always glorifies Jesus. The Holy Spirit will always point us to Jesus. Always. The Holy Spirit comforts us. Jesus called him our advocate, where he, he stands in the gap for us. He defends us. He protects us. He helps us. He is our helper. He it is who makes God the Father and Jesus real personal and intimate to us because he lives within us. Can't get any closer than that. He anoints us to serve God. The Holy Spirit has incredible ministry in our lives. Do you know that you can pray to the Holy Spirit? Why? Because he is God, the Holy Spirit. We can pray to him. Holy Spirit, Teach me what this means. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, lead me. Holy Spirit, I need your comfort. Try it. Try it if you never have. We must obey the word regarding salvation and the baptism in the Holy Spirit, no matter what other people say or do or believe. Acts 2.12. It says there that the God-fearers were amazed and perplexed. Even those who believed in God were amazed and perplexed when they saw what was happening with the disciples. Church, not even all believers will understand or accept what we believe about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The next verse, chapter 2, verse 13, says, Others made fun of them and even attributed their experience to being drunk. Peter goes, You're not drunk, it's only 9 in the morning. People may ridicule us for being Pentecostal. Remember hearing people call Pentecostal people holy rollers? Have you ever heard that? Kind of an older, whatever. Why did they call them that? Because sometimes when the Holy Spirit came on people, they would fall under the power of God. Some of them, I guess, rolled on the floor. So they called them holy rollers. People may make fun of us because they don't understand. They've never experienced it. And it really boils back to they're afraid. Because we fear what we don't know. But we need to remind ourselves this is a God thing. It's miraculous. And it's for me. It's for me. If I'm a believer in Jesus, I can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I get to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
So then we need to ask ourselves, what's my theology? What do I believe about what God says about this, about the experience itself, the gifts of the Spirit? Do I believe God would give me something off the wall or dangerous? Jesus told his disciples, if you know how to give good gifts to your kids, if your kid comes and asks you for a toy, you're not going to give them a poisonous snake, right? If you know how to give good gifts to your kids, don't you think your Heavenly Father will give you only good things? Or do I believe that God has something awesome and miraculous and supernatural in store for me? I don't know how he does it, but he does it. And I want it. We talked about this morning in Sunday School also. Sometimes we seek the sign of the gift rather than the gift, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the closer relationship, the power that comes with it. Sometimes we want the sign, we want the tongues because it's kind of cool. Well, you're right, it is kind of cool, but it goes way deeper than that. It's a deeper relationship with Jesus. Is that what I want? Then what did Jesus say? salvation. We ask and we receive. We ask for the baptism in the Holy Spirit and we receive. It might not happen instantaneously. For me personally it was about a week in between. But when I first asked to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and when I actually received it. Sometimes there's a waiting period. Sometimes we need to grow. We need to seek God. We need to get into the Word. We need to find out what's going on. Sometimes there are issues in our hearts. Sometimes there's unforgiveness. There's unbelief. Sometimes we have issues. And the Holy Spirit wants to clean out the vessel. Prepare us for the Holy. But if we ask, we will receive. And if there is a waiting period, don't you dare believe the devil's lie when he tells you, yeah, see, it's not for you. It is for every believer who asks. Every believer. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.18, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, do you remember from grammar class all those ages ago? When we read something like that, it's a command, basically. Be filled. It is assumed, it is written in, in our minds, that the first word, the subject of that sentence is you. You be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what the Spirit of God is saying to us this morning. You be filled with the Holy Spirit. And why would God tell us that? Because He knows it's good for us. Because He knows we need it. Because He knows the power that He gives with it. Who of us can say that we don't need more power to be a victorious Christian in today's world? We need the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Ephesians 5.18, in the Greek, in which the New Testament was written, it says, you keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. There is the initial asking and receiving. But how many of you know, not how many of you know that sometimes we need We need to continually keep on being filled with the Spirit. How do we do that? By praying in the Spirit, by praying in tongues, by fellowshipping, by being in the Word, by worshiping. That is a continual filling with the Holy Spirit. You be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I would invite you this morning as we worship, as we pray, Every time 
we worship together and pray. Every time we do it on our own, at home, in the car, wherever, we ask. If we've not yet received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the initial what? Physical evidence of that we continually ask, seek, knock. Because Jesus said, if you ask, you receive. If you seek, what? You'll find. And if you keep knocking, what? The door will be open. By whom? God himself. Every opportunity we have, let's seek to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's continually be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because that's where the power comes from. That's where the victory comes from. That's even where the love comes from. Do you work or live with somebody that is like almost impossible to love? More often than we know we pay, right? The power to love God and each other. And that anointing person comes from the Holy Spirit. The more full we are with the Spirit of God, the more loving we will be. Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you will fill us. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Jesus, we come to you and we ask you to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. We come, Lord, we're not seeking the sign. We're seeking you. We want more of you. We want to go deeper and broader farther in you. Holy Spirit, fall upon us. We ask you, Lord, to baptize us in your Holy Spirit. For those of us who have already received God, fill us to overflowing with more and more and more of you. The power and the love and the victory the understanding of your word that comes with it. Give us more of you, Lord Jesus. That is our heart's desire. Holy Spirit, God, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us, God, for wrong attitudes, wrong words, wrong actions, things that don't please you, that don't glorify you. Forgive us, Lord God. Cleanse us from those things that don't glorify you. God, we want to be a clean vessel so that we may be filled with you. Less of us, Lord God, and more of you. Grant the desires of our hearts as we continue, God, to pray and to worship. Lord, may you be exalted. And may you be glorified in us and through us. As we are filled with the flow of the Spirit of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for all that you have in store for us. Things that we may not fully understand and be able to explain, but that prove to us that you are God Almighty, and as such, you are good. You are good. You have only good 